The summer heat is on in the garden and your plants are paying the price. On this episode of Garden Time, we stop by Blooming Junction in Cornelius, Oregon. We check out their drought tolerant garden and we learn what plants you can use for xeriscaping your own backyard. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru in Salem, Oregon. Here at Capital Subaru, we are family. From you, our customers, our coworkers, and even our actual family members work here. This is my son, Casey. We're generations ahead of the competition, and we're always working to keep you and your family moving. We're here for you. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. All the support you need, from sales and financing, to service and parts. We'll be here for you for generations to come. And generations after that. I'm Blake. And I'm Casey. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. Where it's your, your way, way on, on the, the parkway. parkway. Welcome to the Garden Time Podcast. We're based in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in a Zone 8 region. This zone deals with plants that can survive in 10 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. I'm producer Jeff Gustin with your hosts Judy Alaruzzo and Ryan Seeley. Welcome to Garden Time's podcast. I'm Judy Alaruzzo with Ryan Seeley, and today we're at Blooming Junction in Cornelius, Oregon, and we're with Ron, the manager here, but he is also an expert on xeriscaping. So Ron, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, thanks so, for coming out. So Ron, what is xeriscaping? <laughs> so xeriscaping is basically um, a design method or, or principles um, to have to eliminate or re, uh, or reduce the amount of water really in your yard. It's all about implementing certain principles so you don't have to be out watering all the time. Right, because there, there's a lot as you know we're looking at you know our climate's changing and our weather changes and you know right. the, the effects of our yard. We're finding you know more s severe weather. Right, and you know right. we need to adapt and kind of prepare for that. Right. And, uh, you know, um, it hasn't rained here, any measurable rain since since May, which is unusual for us. And it's only getting to be longer periods of time that it does that. Um, I was doing a little research recently and, and it talked about also um, heat is another thing. Um, it talked about how many days of extreme heat we used to have in the 80s, which was 10 to 15. And now we're 25 to 30 um, being days over 90 degrees. So, you know, that heat coupled with lack of rain um, really is a good reason, regardless of what your your views are on climate change, um, to reduce water. It's a precious resource. Right. And there's, but there's a lot of things we can still do with our yards and still have a lot of color and Absolutely. bloom that don't require as much water as maybe some of the older, older plants that were used to be. Yeah, and that's where the xeriscaping comes in. Um, you know, some of the principles in, in xeriscaping is finding plants that have the same requirements, the same water requirements. Um, so you're grouping um, large swaths of a particular plant together. Um, so, you know, those are drought tolerant. I don't need to water those. It doesn't mean you can't have plants in your yard that require water, but you're going to also want to group those together too. Because if you're turning on your automatic sprinklers to take care of that one plant over there and wasting it on these that don't need it, you're just wasting water. Right. So um, grouping together, that's one of the big um, ones in the design of it. Okay. And are these drought tolerant when you plant them? I mean, I don't have to water them in, or is there a period of time? They're not. So uh, for the most part, uh, it's once established. Um, there are things like the ceanothus here, um, uh, the California lilac. Um, that's a plant that actually um, doesn't like summer water. Summer water, you know, can kill it. Um, it's a little tricky one to have in the garden center um, because it doesn't like that summer water, yet you have to keep it alive. Um, but, you know, that's something that you go out your first year and you're watering, you know, maybe once a week and then you're down to every couple weeks. It depends on the weather. Um, and then the second year, you might flood it once or twice in the summertime and that's it. After that, no water. Wow, that's so it's not, a good yeah. pla it's not a good plant to have um, at the border of a lawn. Right, right. And we can get much. into a, the okay. whole lawn thing. <laughs> that's another story, right? That's a whole, that's a whole other principle. Right. Oh, definitely. But, but, there's, but there's a lot, lot as you're planning out these gardens, 
you know, to do it, to do a little homework. And you said you have absolutely, you know, have some principles to kind of help for you to start on that. And you, right. You teach classes out here at Blooming Junction. Yeah, I've done a, a, a zero escape uh, class a few times here. Um, and it's a very successful one. And every time we offer it, there are more and more people that are interested in doing it because they are converting their properties over to a more uh, water friendly, um, you know, plantings. Um, and, you know, I joke about the lawn, but um, that's a huge one that sure. takes up so much water. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and there's a lot of people that are just getting rid of their lawns. Right, right. And it doesn't mean that you have to do, you know, replace it with chamomile or all solid thyme or, you know, one thing or another. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do um, in the way of sedums, the low sedums and stuff like that. Yeah, that'd be beautiful. Um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do um, that doesn't, you know, require that every other day watering right. that sometimes lawns do to look their best. Sure. Not to mention the fertilizer and everything else that make it look green. Right. Yeah, Ron, so we've, we've talked about, you know, the seven principles, and you've already touched on the first one, which is the groupings. What are some of the other principles? To know? Yeah, in, in, in addition to how you would design it, um, one of the first things you would do is take a look at uh, your soil, analyze your soil. Um, you want to make sure that your soil is, um, is going to hold moisture in. So if you have particularly sandy soil, you want, might want to introduce some loam, some um, topsoil to yeah. it. Um, but really you want to get um, something that's well draining. And of course it depends on the type of plant too. Um, but taking a look at, at um, the area that you plan on planting, doing your soil analysis there, and then amending that soil to meet the plant's needs and to be more water wise. Right, because sometimes people have a lot of real heavy clay soil, right. also right. which one yeah. of, you'd want to right. amend also. Exactly, exactly. You want to, the thing with clay soil is, you know, it's, it's great for two weeks out of the year. <laughs> you know, it's mud, right. it's right. like, oh, it's workable. Right. It's concrete. Right. right. So yeah, um, amending that, you know, with some kind of soil conditioner or something like that, gypsum, whatever, whatever you'd like, um, is going to go a long ways. Right. Because it's also important to remember that just because like summertime when we have the heat, you know, especially here in the Northwest, when we have so much rain right. in the wintertime that, you know, sometimes the drought tolerant plants don't want to be sitting in a bog of water during the winter. Right, right. And, and you know, that's and that brings up a good point. There are plants like that. Um, for instance, you know, the agave we have. Um, and you'll see, you know, um, later that we have a huge agave um, in our drought uh, garden up there. Um, people always wonder, you know, how do you do that? Isn't it too cold here for that agave? Well, it's not the, the cold that gets them, it's the water. So what happens is, um, unless they're raised above and allowed the water to sheet away from the root of the plant or the trunk of the plant, uh, the crown of the plant, um, it rots it out from too much water. Mm. Gotcha. But those, they're very hardy here. There are some varieties that do extremely well here. Um, cold doesn't bother them, but it's too much water. Yeah. Okay, so what are some of the other, okay. other uh, principles? Well, a plant selection goes kind of hand in hand with planning and design. Um, and the use of turf, um, you know, there, there, there are many people that love a lawn. Um, you know, we, we're not saying rip out your lawn and plant perennials, but you know, you can certainly reduce the size of your lawn. I'm sure you've driven in neighborhoods and it's just a sea of beautiful, pristine green lawn. Well, you know, we go a long way to cut that down. Right. You know, so you still have a small area for the kids to play on, for you to put a blanket down, sit, relax, whatever you do. It doesn't have to be so extreme. Right. You know, I think a lot of that kind of looks like um, it's just lacking the design. Right. You know, right. it's kind of like just put the grass out. And right, but there is some lawn seed that takes less water and there's the seed mixes that have little wildflowers in them. So there is yeah, ideas to make it look like that. Exactly. You don't have to have Kentucky bluegrass or like we have rye, um, the, the rye right. grass. So there there's are other alternatives. There are clovers. Yeah, um, definitely. There, uh, there's a product, uh, Fleur de Lis, right. you know, with the chamomile and the clover. And right. it's a different look. Right. It's, you know, it's a little bit wilder, but it's, it's wonderful it is pretty yeah it's really nice and, and like you said you don't need to go and re 
eliminate all of right. your lawn. You could right. reduce and eliminate areas right. mm -hmm. of it and add add border plants and then keep adding to it exactly. every throughout time. Just keep taking a little bit more lawn out and add to it. As, as um, the other principle is um, irrigation, um, irrigation techniques. Um, I love to hand water. You know, it it it. I'm one in, one in one with my plant. <laughs> I see what's going on sure, with it. I'm sure. checking it. I'm, you know, when I've got that hose in my hand, I realize that's not for everybody and that they do um, have sprinklers. Um, so you want to make sure your sprinklers are set up, you know, in a responsible way, that it's watering what it should be watering, that it's not, you don't have runoff, um, which happens quite a bit, a lot of times because of poor soil. Um, um, there's obviously ways to correct that. Um, drip irrigation, there's all kinds of right. techniques to use. I like a, a handheld hose myself. <laughs> right, right. right. But, and so, it also allows you to adjust the amount of water that an individual plant right, right. will get or, exactly, may, or may need. Exactly. Yeah. But if you know, in your design principles, you know, you could sit there and just spray that bed because you know it's all the same. Right. Same right. soil condition, same plant. Everything um, and a lot of these look great planted in mass. Right, right, and good deep watering, not just light sprinkling of mist. Exactly. Good deep, let it soak in. And that is so important. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that water daily. Um, um, a lot of them, you know, lawn waterers that water daily, um, not knowing that you know if you really flood that that plant or that lawn. Um, you know, get that water deep down. What that does is pulls those roots down too. Mm -hmm. So then, those days that you can't water, something happens. You you have you you know you have an emergency. You're gone for three or four days. You know your yard's going to survive. It's not going to say, "Hey, it's <laughs> day you? two. Right. Where's my water?" Because <laughs> all the roots stay up on top. Right. So you really do want to pull that down. More water, um, less frequency. Right. Okay. Right. And one watering technique might not be appropriate no, for the entire. No, it's many different. For the no, entire yeah. exactly, right. exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, use of mulch, mm. so important. Um, you know, it's decorative; it looks good, um, but it provides you know great weed control. We have a tumbled concrete out there, and um, one thing I gotta say, um, we don't fertilize, oh. <laughs> so. Um, and for the most part, things look great. Uh, we don't fertilize, and everything just took off when we planted. And I, I it's my opinion <laughs> that uh, that tumbled concrete might have leached some calcium into the oh, <laughs> into the soil sure. or something, because the whole thing really took off. You know, year or two, and a testament to the plants, yeah. of course, that we grow. But um, yeah. Uh, mulches are so important. Uh, we, like I said, we control. Um, you know, it re helps retain moisture, so you're not watering as often. And it's pretty. And it's pretty. It is pretty. Yeah. And, and then, one. and then the last thing to think about is maintenance. Um, you know, and maintenance being, you know, checking your plant's health, um, pruning when needed, um, cutting, cutting things back. Um, a healthy, a healthy plant is going to be less susceptible to uh, bugs and diseases. Sure. You know, so that's only going to be, you know, as long as you're watering correctly, um, taking care of that plant. There are certain bugs that are not going to be attracted to it. Um, certain diseases that are not attracted to it, especially things like powdery mildew and stuff like that. Um, you know, when you have a lot of moisture and, and warmth, you know, you get that powdery mildew on certain plants, but you know, by w reducing that amount of water and watering correctly, not overhead watering. Um, when I do have a hose, it's not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's true. That's I don't give everything tip. a bath. <laughs> no, that's a good tip. That is tip. Yeah, because that just introduces all kinds of problems. Right. right. You know, so, you know, after we kind of have, you know, these seven, seven principles of kind of groundwork as to what we're looking at, you know, some people may, may think that, you know, well, a zero escape yard is very boring. Right. But, you know, we have this table full right. of plants here. There is a lot of color and a lot of texture and a lot of bloom that you oh, can yeah. plant. You can have year round interest, just like a standard garden. Right. But it's just a lot more drought right. tolerant. Right. And right. before we go on, I meant, to, I meant to say that we're going out to their drought tolerant garden 
I'm sorry, I forgot to say <laughs> that, um, after the break. And so you can see it in practice and see how yeah. amazing it is because there are some amazing specimens there. So that right. is going to be fun to do that too. Yeah. So, okay, well, since we have this great table of plants with lots of color, let's just start on, start on one end. You know, there's some good, you know, annuals and perennials, it looks like, that you have in here. Yeah, um, Rudbecki is a, just a, a tried and true plant. Um, this is a little, little gold star. Um, it's just starting to bloom. Um, I have another Rudbeckia right here. Um, this is a new one for us. Um, lion cub. I like the double That's cute. flower. Yeah, it's a very cute and little small. small. Yeah. yeah, it's very small. I think, what, 30 inches? Yeah. yeah. And, and like small it. flowers. 14. Yeah. All right, the, the flowers are like yeah, really yeah. quarter sized or half dollar sized double, double gold blooms. Yeah, those are great. Um, and long blooming, very long blooming into it, fall. Yeah, and more middle of summer to the end of summer, early yeah. fall, like you said. Right, these are just starting to bloom now. You know, and then, you know, this is, you know, this another a, one. Yeah, the yarrow. We have uh, yarrow out there, too. Yarrow is a beautiful one, too. And, you know, the thing with yarrow is um, it really takes to a light shearing after it's bloomed to get it to rebloom. Um, you can see, the, you know, these, the colors are a little bit muted. These are more vibrant. These are newer. And then you've got some coming on. Um, eventually, you do a nice uh, light shear, and it's all going to flesh out again. So that's a long bloomer right. too. And this one's called Saucy Seduction, and has that, you know, real pretty kind of a magenta pink yeah, flower. Yeah, yeah. But yarrows come in lots, lots of different, oh, different yeah. color. Um, I think the first time, uh, or when I started in this industry, yarrow was yellow. Just yellow. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> the, and the, white. the basic yeah. Yeah. silver lacy foliage right, right, right. and yellow. yellow flower. And, and uh, now it's so many everything yeah. but blue. I haven't seen I think, blue. Yeah, no right, blue. you know, pink, pinks and oranges and yeah. reds right. and exactly. cerise and things yeah. like and that. And full sun and a butterfly. Exactly. Loved by butterflies. You know, and and that's a good point, Judy. That you know, everything, most everything here blooms mm -hmm. at one period or another, um, which is a great. Um, pollinator attractor oh yeah you know that's important so many of these are so here's another another kind of fun so this is uh, gara um, windflower um, this is one that actually kind of took off on us out in the garden um, apparently it self seeds so <laughs> if you if you have an area where you want a few of these right um, this is a good one and this one's called whirling butterflies yeah it has kind of the longer, taller, yeah, that's beautiful. right? You know, strands that kind of wisp in the in the wind, and it's a white bloomer. But there's also there's some short ones, compact yeah, ones, yeah. burgundy foliage, right? Very exactly. good foliage, pink blooms, dark pink blooms. So yeah. there's yeah. quite a range of of the garas that would work in there too. But that goes to like that maintenance that you were talking about. It's like sometimes they're a little aggressive, so you take them out, you share them with a friend. Oh, you do. And, and it's, you know, and it's one of those things that, uh, you know, when you're in your garden and you see something come up that's unwanted, it's very easy to move yeah. it right. or eliminate it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this is one of my favorites, Rock Rose. Um, I'll show the flower. <laughs> um, this is just a really, um, in fact, I just planted this in my yard because um, I have deer. Oh. And oh, it's one of the story. things deer will not eat because it's got that leathery kind of feel to it mm -hmm. that they're not attracted to. Um, plus, it's drought tolerant. Um, I think I might have mentioned before. I'm on a spring. Uh, I share water with six other properties. Um, it's gravity fed. You know, it, our water comes from rainfall. So in the summertime, it's no water. You know, my lawn turns, and I'm, by lawn, <laughs> I mean whatever that grass is that I get out and mow every once in a while. And, uh, and um, you know, the weeds that come up. Um, my lawn turns, you know, Brown. wheat colored. Oh, yes. It's wheat. a russet wheat, color. Yes. It's beautiful. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is a good one. Um, I will give it a little bit of water to get it going, mm -hmm. um, but I think by next year, I, I probably won't have to water it. At and all. a lot of your rock roses are more of kind of a larger shrub, right? right? They'll get mm -hmm. that kind of that four yeah, to one's four gonna to get, six foot. This one's gonna get about six feet. So it's it's big, area. so it goes a long way. Right. And a good summer, summer bloom. Exactly, bloom. and I saw that, I gotta say, I saw that at a Jack in the Box paired with <laughs> lavender oh good for them spectacular it was spectacular yeah. um and then i went to 
by this jack in the box again, and they had just butchered it. Butchered. But oh, shoot. anyway, it, for a at, while, at one wonderful. point, it was a beautiful combination <laughs> that I wouldn't have thought of, mm -hmm. but I, I stole yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, so the rock, rock rose gets a little bit bigger, but even, you know, there's some larger items that you can put in there. They give you some larger structure too, like this guy. Yeah, this is an arbutus, a strawberry tree. Um, it's like in the Manzanita family. It gets a really beautiful um, uh, red bark to it. Uh, it gets a small white flower, uh, like a lot of the manzanitas. Um, it, but it produces a fruit. It produces actually an edible fruit. Um, looks it like looks kind of like a strawberry. <laughs> it's, like round. A yeah. it's round. It's round and it's red. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Funny story, when I used to work in high tech in California, they had them in big planters and they're huge, enormous, covered with fruit. Well, I had already worked in the nursery industry before that, so I'd walk by and just grab them and eat them. And everyone thought I was some kind of freak because I was eating the landscape, you know. It's an edible but landscape. But it's, right? it's an incredible, incredible um, plant. Um, it's grown either in a standard form or in uh, a multi trunk. Uh, very tall tree form um, and we have one out here that um, you know uh, we allowed to just maintain it as a large shrub um, Maureen here um, last winter went through and opened it up and and you'll see it's just oh. a because the, nice. the bark, like you said, it's is so red, beautiful, but it's also exfoliating, so right. kind of that peeling, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. art, which, is, which is pretty, you know. And so, mo most of the plants we've kind of looked at on this side are kind of in the you know yellows and pink hues, and you know, kind of mm -hmm. more the perennial to evergreen shrub. But there's also, you know, sticking with those hues, there's some annuals that you can plant that do great for the splashes, right? Of the lantana, That's um, beautiful. this is a great one, and you know, it's kind of really interesting fragrance to it. It's a very pungent, yeah. but it kind of reminds me of when I was a kid. Um, this one's great. It comes in a few different colors. Um, this is Bloomify Rose. Yeah, um, and they, they kind of have yellow. you know yellow, yellows and pinks in various yeah. stages Orange as it, pinks, as it yeah. opens up. And another one that's a great pollinator. Yeah, and I would imagine this is deer proof too because mm. it's got that same yeah, leaf. Kind of leathery. Real, real rough, yeah, they don't rough like leathery. That. Leaf. And I then one that, other annual we have uh, down here. Yeah, that's an interesting. This is Celosia. This is Orange Fire. Um, this is drought tolerant. It looks like candy for deer. <laughs> so don't try that. But it's a beautiful plant. Um, great in pots, you mm -hmm. know, or plug it into your perennial bed for a really Pop. shock right. of color. Another one that you can get bright yellows, bright oranges, bright reds. Right. And, it is right. really and a real kind of a feathery fluffy almost kind of like a pompous grass yeah kind yeah of, mm -hmm. kind of look. and then down down front we kind of touched on a little bit of you know sedums and succulents as as to some like lawn replacement options right. for the real low creepers you know we don't have to go through all of these but we do there's uh, an amazing array of colors yeah we do um a lot of sedums out in our parking strip or i should say uh, the entry um both sides are, are planted and sedumed um, and it's really ever-changing. Uh, the plant itself changes, the flowers change, they, they are either blooming white or pink, um, then they turn into a russet color and then you kind of mow that off and it's just a, a nice green or gray. Um, but you know once we got that uh, established, um, it was maybe two years, um, you know, and, and we didn't, you know, plant every every foot or so um, it took a little while for it to cover in uh, to to cover right um, I would say probably two and a half seasons right That's so um, but after that there was no watering nice. uh, very little weeds because it right. acts as its own you know right mulch nice. if you will yeah with the, the greens and the burgundies and the green and yellow yeah, bicolors. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of fun. So many textures. And they do come use. in a bunch of different colors. There's yellow, uh, I mean, as far as flower colors go. Right. You know, there's reds and pinks and yellows. And um, and then we have tall sedum too. Mm -hmm. um, the tall sedum being like the autumn joy where you get, um, you know, very early fall, that big, bright pink. Right. And they're really hardy for across the country, for people that are listening or watching. I mean, I think they go down to minus 40. 
So we would just wor very... have to worry about too much water. I mean, that's right. what you would worry about. Yeah, and that one is deer proof too. I have that one at my oh, house. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will point out everything that's deer proof. They like there. the agave or no? They're scared of the agave. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so that gives us you know, a lot of color. And then when mm -hmm. people think drought tolerant, a lot of times they think real like Mediterranean, mm -hmm. where you have a lot of you know the silver and purple hues. So I mean, Judy, down at your end of the table, you know, I got all the we, silver. You got a lot of the silver in the in the purples, which are just stunning when you mix them all together. Yeah. This one I think is really intriguing. It almost looks like a silver tumbleweed and or a Santalina. I think we're kind of used to Santalinas, but what is this one? This is a cushion bush and it um, it does look like a Santalina, but the, the foliage uh, is very waxy. Yeah, and bright silvery white. Yeah, really it pretty. just begs you that touch it right 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 and give us the name and maybe a common name Cal uh, this is calicephalus mm -hmm. um, brownie eye um, a cushion bush yeah and it's all in bud and so these buds are probably open to yellow I would yes. think like yeah. sulfur yellow that is kind of borderline for us hip up here um, in uh, the northwest but I think down it's a zone nine so that's about 30 degrees so I right. think that California would be fine or other places in the United States that yeah and I'm warmer. not sure if we touched on that but something like the lantana too that is something that is that's tender here yeah right. um, this is a little iffy so um, you know if you're in a microclimate yeah, you which would we have plenty of. Sure. Um, that might work for you. If not, I might even try it in a pot. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. Or, sure. Or plant it, enjoy it, get a it, yeah. get a season out of exactly. it, and then next yeah. year if you liked it, plant plant another exactly. one. Exactly. I do that a lot, yeah. definitely. And we're going to stay with that silver theme. And so this is really beautiful. It's kind of silver on the back side of the leaf, but beautiful, kind of a soft green. You know, this is a Senecio, and I tell you, I didn't really appreciate this plant as much as I should have until I saw it uh, mature. Oh. And it, it just took, it was just incredible. Um, in this state here, it's a fine looking plant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got nice color, the leaves are great. Um, but it, it's maturity is a spectacular And how plant. tall will that be once it's mature? This one gets about 30 inches. Okay, so it's at a foot. I mean, it's beautiful as a foot, but it's one of those watch to watch. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. This is the leaves almost one. kind of remind me of like a lamb's ear. Where yeah, definitely. Like kind of yeah, that, you that would expect little, it to be very fuzzy. soft. Yeah. Um, it's more waxy than soft. And then this one here, I would just keep having to pet it because it's a small kind of, um, it looks like a shrub. Mm -hmm. And again, it's very um, fuzzy and it's green with a little silver on it. And that is just, I, yeah. I just think that's so pretty. We have this in our uh, bed out there too. This is a silver lotus. Um, this is a really nice plant. Um, you know, it's a foliage plant. It, it gets a little, um, a little, I, I want to say the other name for it is, I'm trying to think. Um, canary. Oh, Harry Canary. Okay, Harry Canary. I it like it. Harry Canary. <laughs> it might Let's be. It fits one. Anyway, it gets a little. Uh, <laughs> it gets a little beak type flower oh, okay. on it. This oh, is okay. this is a great little. Yeah. Plant. No, I I love it. I think it would be nice yeah, in a pot the, the or as a little ground well cover. Soft. Yeah. Very soft. I have to double check that. One. Okay, and then um, another one that it looks like eucalyptus. I mean, if everybody knows what eucalyptus, very unusual leaf shape, but this has an interesting flower spike that's kind of uh, violet blue, um, and it's a parahebe, which it's is a parahebe, like which hebe. is not a hebe, right? Like. Or yeah, like, 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 yeah. like. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great plant, and and that's done really well out um, in our uh, dry bed how too. Big that gets. It's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful plant, and I imagine you know it would be great for cutting and oh, you know, so. adding yeah. to flower arrangements, much like you would a eucalyptus. Yeah, and it has a really graceful habit, so yeah. to about to two feet. So I think it nice kind of um, arching kind of habit there. And then we kind of touched on Ceanothus, and this mm -hmm. one is um, the, the uh, dark, star. dark Star, which is a smaller leaf Ceanothus or California Lilac, right. but it has that same cobalt blue flower. But this one I think is really interesting because I love the texture on it. I mean, I love Victoria, that's a nice one, but this one has an interesting kind of shrubby, more um, open texture. Yeah, and I, and, and, and I have to say, I think the smaller, um, tighter foliage um, it might be hardier than some oh, of the sure. the broader, longer, you sense. know, foliage of some of the other varieties. 
Um, that's one I have at my house. That does really well, and that is deer proof. And that gets bigger too. Huge. It's going to get like a big. <laughs> but it would be nice for hedge instead right. of doing oh, arbavita or something. Exactly. Exactly. As, and no maintenance. There right, is no right. maintenance at all to that plant. And we would be remiss uh, not Without, talking about yeah. lavenders. And so this is a beautiful silver foliage one, which yeah, is beautiful. Yeah, this is Anna beautiful. Luisa. This is pretty, and it's got just beautiful foliage. I love how silvery it is. Smells great. Everything you want in a lavender. Yeah. And, um, and I think lavenders, people, I think in the Northwest, we water them too much, and they kind of die very fast. So I think if you kind of keep them a little drier, they're going to last longer in your garden. Yeah, and the thing about lavenders, too, um, that I find with people that come in here and, and either are replacing lavenders or turned off to lavenders, is that you really do need to prune your lavenders. Oh, that is true. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't want that old world Mediterranean <laughs> look, you know, where it gets very woody, woody and sprawled, right. Yeah, right. Um, which a lot of people don't, um, you know, it's best to, you know, once they've bloomed or, you know, right before they've opened up completely, that's when you want to give it a tight shear. Um, but you definitely want to do it um, before winter. Right. It also saves the plant from any snowpack that will splay sure. the plant and crack it and, right. and kill it. Um, but I think that's the biggest problem that people have is that they forget to do that. Yeah. Um, rosemary is kind of like that too. Once it gets out of shape and woody, it's kind of hard to get back. So you either have to live with that kind of... <laughs> It's artistic. And, and, it some, is artistic. Yeah. and you know, some t it's it's a fine look, but I find more people are disappointed with that. Right, right. No, it's a good tip, and we tell people don't be afraid to prune, and so don't be afraid to Love prune to your prune. lavenders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Russian sage. This is a beautiful one called Little Spire. Yeah. Another silvery green foliage, but these beautiful spikes of um, big plumes almost of lavender yeah. colored flowers. Yeah. Very pretty. And it's not a sage, but no. it's a Russian. Sage. It's a Russian sage, Perovskia, and really, really nice. They get to be shrubs. They're small varieties, tall varieties. Yeah, die back completely um, in the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but really pretty, very um, deer resistant. Deer, deer resistant, proof. and it comes in so many different uh, sizes, yes, too. Yes, definitely. Many different sizes. And you know, the star of the midsummer, I think, are coneflowers, echinacea. And yeah. you have two beautiful, a yellow one and a red one, which is kind of different than the you know standard purple. Right, right. But Tell us a little bit about the care and of echinaceas here. Well, echinaceas, once you're established, do you like it uh, dry? Um, you know, uh, an occasional watering is fine, um, but they do very well. Um, you know, it's another plant that dies back uh, in the wintertime. Um, I would say, you know, it always looks best depending on what the cone does. Sometimes the cone's one of the more interesting things of it. Sure. Um, but, you know, if it's not, cut that, you know, deadhead them, keep them fresh looking. Um, but they're a great plant. Bees love them. You know, this one uh, we were commenting on before. Yeah, look at those how the cones. cone has just a really interesting color. To yeah, they're it. like two tone. Usually they're just one color, brown or black, and they're really got yeah. stripes in them. Yeah, and I think the breeders have really outdone themselves. There's so many colors and habits yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And grasses, I think I think gardens, whatever kind of garden needs grasses, just for motion and that texture. So which ones are more um, water-wise? These, these particular ones here, this is a blue stem and, and uh, this is a nice grass. Um, it does very well in the garden, very well behaved. There are certain grasses I did not bring because I don't think they're well <laughs> behaved. Uh, this is a good one. Right. Um, so this is a great little grass. Um, and then also the switchgrass, um, you know, and these, these will get uh, darker colors here um, and take on some really a nice contrast. Mm -hmm. um, but these are great grasses to have in the garden. And there's so many of them right. that, that are drought uh, tolerant. Right, and this is kind of greenish blue, but it's turning burgundy already. Yeah. And it's only yeah. midsummer, which is a nice, you know, a nice change. And kind of a testament to the hot days. It's been hot, had. yes, it's been really hot. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and we have one more tree that's a native tree, if you can kind of address yeah, that. Yeah, this is the Amelanker uh, service berry. Um, you know, uh, natives, for the, for the most part, um, do well in, obviously, in our area. Um, some natives are not uh, adapting as well as they should, um, or they could, I should say. 
Um, but the surface berry seems to be doing just fine as, as one of the names with our, you know, uh, little climate change we have going on. Um, drought tolerant, it also um, takes, um, you know, a, a water well. So if you do have our clay soil, um, it's going to survive in both conditions, um, wet clay soil and dry right. clay concrete. And bringing up natives, I think because many people are listening to this, it's like there's natives in everybody's area. So just kind of check, right. you know, what's native to your area right. and that would be appropriate for your garden. Right. So just not in the Good Northwest, point. you know, we have, we have our own. <laughs> well, Ron, you have, have a gr great selection of plants that you've you know, educated us with. So I think we're going to take a quick break. We're going to hear from our, our sponsor, Capital Subaru. And then after the break, we're going to head up front to your display garden to see how some of these plants have survived in your conditions. Great. Sounds good. Here at Capital Subaru, we are family. From you, our customers, our coworkers, and even our actual family members work here. This is my son, Casey. We're generations ahead of the competition, and we're always working to keep you and your family moving. We're here for you. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. All the support you need, from sales and financing to service and parts. We'll be here for you for generations to come. And generations after that. I'm Blake. And I'm Casey. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family, where it's your, your way, way on the parkway. parkway. For 75 years, Owl's Garden and Home has been a favorite destination of local gardeners. Starting in a small roadside fruit stand off of 99E in Woodburn by Al Biggie, Al's has grown to four retail locations in the Portland metro area that also includes a huge growing operation near Hubbard. To ensure that you get the highest quality, Al's grows over 80% of the plants they sell. This fourth generation family owned business is now one of the most recognized garden centers in the country. Stop by one of our four locations to learn why Al's is the first stop for Northwest gardeners. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Welcome back to the Garden Time Podcast. I'm with Ron and we're at Blooming Junction. And Ron, this is your front display bed and it's drought tolerant, water wise, whatever we want to call it. And so tell us a little bit about how old is it? Well, um, it's probably eight years old. Um, we've been in business now, this is our 10th season. Um, and we put this in uh, with, the, with the plan of, uh, not watering these beds to have them um, you know um, drought tolerant um, part of it was you know experimental um, some things most of it made it some things didn't make it um, but like i said you know with the lack of um, rains we've had um, you know with it have, not having rained since may um, we are starting to supplement the water and by that i mean you know maybe once a month not you know, bad. we'll flood it. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, you know, um, everything here is drought tolerant and receives what I would consider very minimal water. Yeah, and you can tell that it's so dry and yeah. it, you talk, we see that kind of granite um, top dressing here. And the plants that you talked about, they are thriving out here. I mean, yeah. they're huge. Yeah, and this is, this is probably the hardest, hottest part of the property. Yeah, we're in the full sun. It's the late afternoon. Yeah, and it's the very late hot. Late afternoon is very hot. And we're yeah. sur surrounded by gravel, and you have you know gravel in the bed, so you have right. a lot of reflective heat. It's right. hot. Yeah, it's <laughs> a, yeah, we definitely definitely feel the heat as we're out here. But it's great to kind of see what some of these plants are. And there's a few out here that we didn't talk about about inside. So like right behind me is cardoon. Yeah, um, this this is another one that uh, we found likes to travel in the garden. <laughs> Um, we planted one, and right now we have three. Uh, we have had probably up to five, um, but it's very easy to maintain, um, and just a beautiful plant. Um, the thing with them is, you know, they're not edible. They, a lot of people think they're artichokes. They're not. They're obviously in that thistle family. Um, the part that is edible is the stem with 
with processing, right. which I understand is some work. Yeah, it is. It's very Mediterranean, very Italian. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we did a story <laughs> one time, but but the te you know they're taller than Ryan. It's over six feet tall, and they're just if you have a statement kind of garden, yeah, right. they are something to put. Oh, it's yeah, it's an incredible plant, yeah. just incredible. And when it dries, it's really incredible too. Cool. You know, we we love it because we go back and we chop it for you know, our fall decor and stuff <laughs> right. like that, you know, it, it's a great plant. Yeah. You know, another one that... Bees you know, love it too. Yeah. Another one we didn't talk about inside, which is a great one, are olives. Yeah, you know, this olive's done really well. I kind of planted it here for just to get a little shade and, um, you know, I don't have another ol olive to pollinate it in the area, but every once in a while I get a couple little olives off right. of it. That's cool. And people don't think of olives, especially here in the Northwest, right. as being able to, able to survive, but obviously it's, it's doing quite right. well. Right. Well, I have a feeling it's going to become more and more olives. Oh, for sure. You know, it's, it's kind of not quite with the hazelnuts, but there are, <laughs> right. there are quite a few right. olive farms now. Right. And that agave, it's a showstopper. And it's it's been in here eight years, and it is massive agave. I, you know, our friend used to live in um, Provence, France, and he said they're all over the countryside, and he's, and this is probably in, in kin with that. Yeah, um, that I would say that was probably a three or five gallon size when we planted it, um, you know, so big. Right, right. Um, three by three, but now it's like five, five by five. they're not typically real fast-growing plants, no. so. No, um, but it's just done really well. It loves that location. Um, tucked away back there is a nice place to sit. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you um, said, elevated up enough where it gets the drainage. Right, it is on a berm, um, so it does shed that water off. You know, and this one down here, you know, we talked about it in, inside. <laughs> And I think we the hairy canary, the hairy Lotus. canary, yes, hairy canary. Canary. Yes, right. that one. So it's <laughs> nice, nice to see it kind of in the landscape as it's yeah, it's spread great out, you cover. know, three foot by three foot, and even though it's it says marginally, you know, like a zone eight right. on a tag, it's obviously doing doing yeah, quite it, well. Yeah, it does really well here. Uh, looks great when it's in bloom. And it's the drainage probably that's probably getting it. If we do get cold, it's not sitting in wet, so it can survive those cold temps. Yeah, and that's important too because we didn't have. Um, you know, premium soil brought in um, when we designed this. You know, we had loads of topsoil brought in and, you know, we just kind of went with it. Um, so, just like the customers. Right. I mean, yeah, that, that's so normal gardeners. Like, I mean, gardeners do that. You just make exactly. it work. Yep. Exactly. And you, and you adjust as you go. Like yeah, you said, you definitely. know, some winters, they've right. been great. And you might have gotten five, six, six years out of it. Right. And then one year you didn't. But right. that, gives you the opportunity right. to kind of, kind of change. But that. we do recommend adding drainage material. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so then we have this side of the garden. And well, then, yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't like it was hard clay soil. It, right. was, it was good topsoil, but, um, you know, other than that, there was not uh, amendments or anything. Right. It, was, it was the plant and the soil. Excellent. Yeah. So, so let's head to the other side of the garden where we have more uh, kind of the blooming perennials over there. Okay, Ron, so now we're on the other side of the entrance. And there's a little bit more blooming on this side. There is. And you know, the interesting thing too is, I don't know how it happened, but that side over there tends to be blue. Ah. And this side over here tends to be a little bit more diverse in the color. Ah. But it's kind, for it's some kind of reason, like the table that, that we had right, 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 right out, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, that, when that is in full bloom on the other side, it's a lot of blue. Ah, yeah. Anyway, so but yeah. But there is, there is some blue back here, yeah, so. That, yeah. Russian the Russian sage. sage is in bloom right now, looking good. Um, Arrows. You know, we did a lot with the, the large boulders. So there are little seating areas here, lots mm -hmm. of photo opportunities. Um, we have some grasses in the back. Um, uh, the large shrubs that you'll see with remnants of blooms on them is Baptisia. Yeah, there's one. Um, so we have mm -hmm. a few of those in through here. And, and there's some Euphorbia. In there are euphorbia. Um, about, that so. was one we found traveled to. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then nice we also have, you have several uh, flavors or colors of the yarrow. Yes, yes. There's like a yellow, a pink, and then something blooming. And I think those are great. They Some do bloom earlier, but usually July, August are when they shine. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and then as we kind of transition over to kind of this area of the garden, you know, we have more of more colors of the arrow. We have some Shasta daisies, which I'm a little 
We do have Shasta daisies. Yeah, which so is one of those. Experiment that or? No, I tell you, um, Shasta daisies are one of the flowering plants in my yard that do well. Oh, excellent. I don't water them. They, they're very drought tolerant and, and deer resistant. That's a surprise. That is a surprise. Yeah. And then you'll have, you'll, we talked about you know, the strawberry tree or the. Yeah, the that's, the, that's the, that's the strawberry tree. That's and that, nice. that one, you know, that's, that got planted when we started this. And it was uh, a little bit bigger than the one we talked about in the beginning of the segment, but um, not very big at all. So um, you know, it's not extremely fast growing, uh, but it puts on a lot of girth, keeps its nice compact form. Um, love that tree. What do you yeah. think it is now? Like maybe eight by eight? Yeah, yeah. So it's nice, a smaller garden, or if you need a focal point in the front or something. It's excellent for a small garden. In fact, that's one thing that people struggle with, um, homeowners struggle with especially with today's smaller yards, you know, with new construction. Yeah. They're looking for a small tree. Right. Um, I do point to these in a standard form because nice. a standard, you know, gives you a little bit more height before the head spreads right. out. Right. Yeah. You know, you know, one thing, you know, all of these plants have in common is they're all blooming advantage plants. So tell they us are. a little bit about blooming advantage plants. Well, blooming advantage plants are grown down the street at blooming uh, nursery. Um, owned by Grace Dinsdale. Uh, she does a fine job with perennials, sh um, shrubs, um, oh. herbs, grasses, pretty much everything. Yeah, she's a yeah. good grower. Uh, does grower. It very innovative, um, does a lot of great work. Um, and, you know, for the most part, everything's cold grown. So it's, it's a very hardy plant early in the season. And you're, and you're doing more than just, you know, xeriscaping plants. You know, you have you know, annuals and vegetables and baskets yeah, and houseplants yeah. and, it's, you know, and a huge line of the perennials and, and shrubs and trees. Right. It's you pick season and we do blueberries, blackberries, uh, strawberries. It was a very short season yeah, this year. this year it was, yeah. Unfortunately, but, you know, um, blueberries is on strong so if you like blueberries come on down and it's cut flowers too that's really we do, we're cool. doing we just started doing cut that's flowers out idea. front um, it looks pretty when you come in and you know come in and with the family and cut some flowers that is cool take a class we have classes almost every weekend um, we focus on uh, culinary classes this time of year because you know we we're a farm too so we grow a lot of our own produce and right. people like to can that right you know, so people can come out here to Blooming Junction and pick up all Blooming Junction plants. But, you know, for those that are not here necessarily in the Portland metro area or outside the area, Blooming Junction or Blooming Advantage plants are sold at lots of fine garden centers throughout yeah, the Pacific um, Northwest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, um, California, the Pacific Northwest is, is really the territory that the Blooming Advantage sells. So really talk to your garden center, your yep. independent garden center, and ask them if they have them or tell them to get them. Right. <laughs> right. Or come out here to Blooming Junction you or yeah. you have a website that has a lot of this great we information do. too. Bloomingjunction.com for all the information, uh, classes. Um, we also have our, our plant uh, inventory online, which is unique because it is live inventory. Wow. So a plant gets sold, it takes it out of the inventory. For the most part, uh, you know, our inventory is very accurate. Wow. It's great if you're up late at night and <laughs> have some ideas, just scroll through and see what we got. Oh, no, for sure. Well, Ron, it's been a pleasure to be out here. We, it's a wealth of information. You have some amaz amazing plants. So we want to thank you for being our host today. And we want to thank Capital Subaru, our sponsor, uh, for this podcast and Excellent. for being out so thanks thank you for, for having, having us out. and we'll see you next time in the garden hi i'm sarah with portland nursery where our passion for plants has kept us rooted in this incredible community a lot has changed since we first opened our doors but through it all, we've remained family owned and operated, dedicated to providing our neighbors the largest selection of the highest quality plants Portland has to offer. With hundreds of new plants arriving each week, you're guaranteed to find something exciting and unique. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants at 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. 
Trim is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. Dram products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. Dram for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Here at Capital Subaru, we are family. From you, our customers, our coworkers, and even our actual family members work here. This is my son, Casey. We're generations ahead of the competition, and we're always working to keep you and your family moving. We're here for you. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. All the support you need, from sales and financing to service and parts. We'll be here for you for generations to come. And generations after that. I'm Blake. And I'm Casey. We make it easy to join our Capital Subaru family. Where it's your, your way, way on, on the, the parkway. parkway.